Chapter 4, The Violin That Changed My Destiny In Mao's China, there was no wrongdoing in all of my childhood that could compare to this crime. That crime was my passion for the violin. Falling in love with violin at first sight. No school to go to, and too young to participate in any revolutionary activities, to me, those days were the most mind-numbing time in my life. But one day, a miracle happened. A neighbor who lived on the second floor of the building next to us had a teenage visitor, called, Lee. That handsome young man soon had a chemical reaction with my neighbor Sister Lon. Every morning when Sister Lon visited him, he would keep the window open and play a violin. How romantic it was. I was rather drawn to that violin sound, then, inebriated. Every morning I kept my eyes wide open, anxiously waiting for the window to be opened. One day, Lee's window opened only for a very short while and then closed without playing the violin. I couldn't help but rush up to the second floor of their building and peek inside through the keyhole. Oh my god. Guess what I saw. I saw both brother Lee and sister Lon naked, holding and rolling together on the bed. Back to my kitchen, I described vividly what I saw to Humimi and added my wise comment, if they were cold they should not be naked, if they were hot they should not hold so tightly onto each other, they should open the window. Humimi's face turned flush and she ran away into her room before I finished my blowing. Later I met Humimi's elder brother, a red guard. Again I repeated the story, not forgetting to add my comment. Mimi's brother too, did not wait until I finished and walked away. The next morning, a small group of red guards broke into Lee's home. A moment later, brother Lee and sister Lon were brought out from the room, naked. Lee suppressed his bird tightly with his violin, as if the bird would fly away if not held down tightly enough. Lon too, though her two big breasts were completely revealed, both the front and back of her lower parts, were covered by Chairman Mao's portraits. I felt those were two of the most attractive portraits of Mao's. However, if I could choose, I would rather take the violin. From then on, I never saw Brother Lee again. And Sister Lon couldn't find a man to marry until the Cultural Revolution ended ten years later. By that time in China, sex was considered to be ugly, and for people to sleep together naked before marriage was a shameful crime. Although Brother Lee was no longer there, every day I would look at that window, hoping the violin would sound again. Umimi seeing I was so obsessed with the violin, told me Lee's violin was placed together with all of the other four olds trash, in a huge storehouse. Again and again, I begged Mimi to ask her brother for help. Mimi must have been annoyed to death and in the end she lied to her brother, claiming that she herself would like to see the violin. Her brother took the violin secretly and ordered his sister, only touch it at home and never make any sound out from it. Every day, when every one of both our families were out, Mimi brought the violin to the kitchen and let me play with it. I carefully took it as a fragile treasure. Although the violin had no bow, I still put it to my neck, playing with sound from my mouth, mostly Lee's favorite tune, Jian Gu Gu, M.O. Lo Tu. One day when Mimi went out to wash vegetables, there was no water supply in most Chinese households, we all had to do all washing in public places, I was in such high spirits that for a moment I forgot the promise to stay inside without sound. I took the violin to the backyard and played with an empty right hand but sound from my mouth, under Brother Lee's window. That bold action resulted in the violin being taken away immediately, plus the name of who Mimi's brother being deleted from the red guard list. Though in reality I had no violin, my head was filled with nothing but violin. Two. A violin, in a shop's glass cabinet. One day, 
I happened to see a violin in a glass cabinet at Changsha May First Cultural Goods Store. Beside the violin there was a little notice written, a propaganda weapon of Mao's thoughts. I flattened my nose against the glass cabinet for a long, long time until the heat of my nose melted the glass and I got the violin. Of course that was only what I daydreamed. In reality I was scorned out of the shop. After that, I grew a habit of running a marathon every day, from home to the shop, about five kilometers one way, just to take a look at the violin again, from a safe distance. One day, the two shopkeepers were debating. The short fat man had a red chevron and the words, Xiang Jiang Wind and Thunder, one of the extreme rebel organizations, on his arm. While the slim, tall lady had a red chevron on her arm and the words, the protector of Mao's thoughts, one of the loyalists. The debate went so rigorously that they didn't notice me at all as I approached the violin. Again, I flattened my nose. This time, I even checked the price, 28 renminbi, about 7 US dollars at that time, and half the monthly salary of my daddy or mom. I stood there for a long time, in fact as long as I could, fantasizing how wonderful it would be if I had had 28 renminbi. After some time, I started to believe that I did have 28 renminbi. To avoid their eyes, I faced them and requested with all my courage. Please, that violin, pass it to me. Let me take a closer look. The lady stood up from her chair and opened the glass cabinet without looking at me. But the man recognized me right away and roared at me. Valuable goods, no show to kids. My feelings were hurt, but like a civilian facing a Chinese policeman, there was nothing I could do, except comfort myself. Big deal. Wait till my father comes back. That rebel didn't let me finish my self-soothing talk, chasing me with a flyswatter brandished in his hand. I saw trouble and put my dash training to good use. Running out of the violin store, I turned around to check if he was still after me. When I felt I was a safe distance, I shouted toward the violin store again. Big deal. Big deal. Wait until I glow up. I'll run a violin shop a hundred times bigger than yours. That dwarf once more chased me, this time not with a flyswatter but a big broom in his hand. Even after such an unpleasant experience, the habit of running this marathon every day from home to the shop did not stop, for the temptation of the violin was too strong to resist. The difference between before and after was that I was no longer able to flatten my nose against the glass cabinet. Now, I was forced to imagine the shape of the violin from outside the store, constantly comforting myself by thinking. Wait until my father comes back. Father, Son and Violin 3. One more crack between father and me. Father did come back, at last. He not only came back, but also bumped into my twelfth birthday. It was our family's tradition that the birthday person would be specially treated with a bowl of noodles covered with a poached egg. When a bowl of warm noodle with steam floating up into the air was placed in front of me, and especially when we saw the yellow coming out of the white poached egg, there is no need to mention how terrible the temptation was. My elder brother Danson kept swallowing his slobbers and younger brother Dan Han kept his eyes tightly shut. To me, that was a great moment, the only brief moment I looked forward to for a year was that particular day and that time I could feel above all my brothers and, be special among the family. Conversely, that must always be the moment that turns my folks' stomachs the most. Usually I would make the moment last as long as possible, one second longer if I could. But on that day, I behaved to the opposite. Unexpectedly, I clipped the poached egg with my chopsticks, placed it in front of Dan Han's eyes and quickly put it into his bowl before my parents could stop me from this practical joke. Next I clipped a few noodles, raising them up into the air and then pushed the whole bowl of noodles in front of Danson. That's wonderful. You have become so much more reasonable. You've grown one year older after all. Mom praised. Is the noodle poisoned or are you sick, witch? Danson asked me without moving his eyes away from the noodle. Neither. Father answered. 
I think this has to be a new trend of class struggle. If you don't tell us what kind of drugs you want to sell in your bottle in time, the egg will be gone. After all, father was more experienced. What a deceitful fox. If you force me. I borrowed the birthday courage requested. What I want is an instrument, a musical instrument, but not an ordinary musical instrument. It is the queen of musical instruments. It is the most elegant and the most... I wanted to go on. Blow your gas out quickly. What do you want? Mom was out of patience. Okay, to cut it short. The most elegant and the most beautiful thing I want. Meanwhile, Dan Hen clipped the poached egg with chopsticks and placed it in front of his mouth. Okay, okay. Violin. That's right, father and mother, I want a violin. I made a violin playing gesture in the most elegant way. I brought out my wish in a way not as I had rehearsed many times. What, Lin? What was that? For what use? Father kept asking questions without giving me a chance to answer. How much? Mother asked the last but not least, in fact it was the most important question of all. 28 renminbi. I have decided to buy it a long time ago. Hence I started to imagine father taking me to the store. We would wait until that dwarf was present and father would throw 28 renminbi on his face. Then the man would know how strongly my father was supporting me. With that imagining, I broke into a satisfied laughter. What? You must be out of your mind. 28 renminbi to buy you a hand, Lin. Later I'll have to pay 280 renminbi to buy you a piano when you grow even older. Mother must have been very irritated as she raised the pitch of her voice high enough to be a Beijing opera singer. What kind of musical instrument is that? Father intentionally pronounced. What as, Hati, to show his despise. That. Mother did not let me go on with what I wanted to say. She shouted again, as if she was being robbed. No matter what you say, I have no money to buy you a hand, Lin. Violin. I also raised my voice up. It is such an elegant violin, and from your mouth it becomes hand, Lin. Country folk. Mother opened her mouth again, but before her words came out father took over. Whether it is called a violin or hand, Lin doesn't matter. What matters is that our family does not raise, educate, that. This is what we call, prefer proletarians grass rather than capitalist seedling. In finishing his statement father added, Ha T, what, violin, gas. G-A-S, those were the three letters given to me as my twelfth birthday present, by my father. I was speechless, watching Dan Hen devour the egg voraciously, I responded quickly, clamping his throat forcing him to open his mouth. At the same time Danson took the opportunity and quickly filled his mouth with noodles and soup, then pushed the bowl back to me before I could do anything to him. That was my birthday, my poor twelfth birthday, full of melancholy and sadness. My birthday party, if I may call it a party, was quickly over, more quickly than ever before. I couldn't get to sleep until very late that night. I kept thinking of the violin, the disaster that had happened to Brother Lee and Brother Hu, the dwarf salesman, the loss of my poached egg, and quietly I overheard my parents' conversation in the next room. Mother's voice. 28 renminbi, almost half of my monthly salary, it is really too, too expensive. If it were 8 renminbi. Father's response. Even if it were 5 renminbi we shouldn't buy it for him. The question is not how much. The question is, why is he thinking of playing the violin? Who influenced him? We all know in the present situation, anything to do with the West is politically sensitive. That includes a violin, of course. Just like millions of Chinese people at that time, father was a complete revolutionary, even when in bed with his wife. Mom laughed and she asked. The reason you dislike Danju is because he looks like me more than you? Hey hey hey. Father asked a rhetorical question. Like you what? For example, my nasty temper, stubbornness, straightforward. Mother pointed out all her shortcomings. Meanwhile, I heard father turn over. I imagined that he was facing or had his back to mother, and then father's voice turned low and heavy, 
sounding somewhat like self-criticism. Though the whole content I cannot remember, the last sentence I can't forget and would never forget, ever. The sentence from my father's was. I dislike that child by nature. I dislike that child by nature. That statement aroused storms and waves in my mind and heart. Being afraid of waking the other two brothers, I did not release my crying with sound, I literally drank my tears. Perhaps because of that silent crying, after all these years, every time I remember those words I feel like crying out. No matter how many times I have done so, I just cannot heal the wound completely. That night, I had a dream. The dream brought me to a fairy tale world. I walked into a small wooden house, a house with violins hanging everywhere. I myself turned into a violin, pulling a bow across me caused beautiful music to come out. Suddenly, the door fiercely opened and father appeared in front of me. He yelped at me loudly with heavy breath. I dislike you by nature. I cried out with my broken heart. Why by nature? My emotion turned into a strong wind blowing all the violins up to the sky. I myself became a kite, a huge kite gone with the wind further and further away from father. But I could not escape him completely as the string of the kite was held firmly in his hand. After making my every effort to get away from him, I, as a kite without a string to take control, headed straight to the ground. I woke from the dream, asking myself the same question over and over. Why, does my old man dislike me, by nature? Why, does my old man dislike me, by nature?